Good evening, and welcome to the State Representative Washington 6 Candidates Forum. This program is part of a series being presented by The Bridge and Orca Media to help voters get to know their candidates better. Washington 6 includes the towns of Callis, Marshfield, and Plainfield. This is a one-seat district. The current incumbent chose not to run for re-election, so it is an open seat. All eligible candidates were invited to participate, not just those representing a major party. I am Keith Ghostland. I am one of the co-hosts of the Orca Media show, All Things LGBTQ, and I will be tonight's moderator. My condolences to start. A reminder, please vote. All registered voters should have received a ballot in the mail. Please read the instructions carefully and remember to sign and date your ballot. If you have not received a ballot, please contact your local town clerk. Now, to review the format for tonight. Yes, it's that time. Make sure your snacks are ready and adjust the recliner. Here we go. This is a forum, not a debate. Candidates will not be asking questions of each other. However, if you are watching this live, you may call into Orca Media at 802-224-9901 if you have a question. Somebody will write it down, put down your first name, town of residence, and then provide it to me to ask as time allows. Each candidate is going to be given up to two minutes for an introductory statement. They will also be offered one minute for a closing statement at the conclusion of tonight's forum. I will alternate questions between the candidates though, so that one candidate is not always answering first. The order of questions has been randomly assigned and the candidates were not provided with copies of the questions in advance. Each candidate will be given up to a minute and a half for their response. There is a timer in the studio to keep track. And if there's an indication, I may ask for a brief follow-up. I will continue to ask questions back and forth, and I have five pages, until we run out of time. So, and the questions came from a request on front porch forums for community input, input from the staff of both the Bridge and Orca Media, and some of my own questions. So that's hopefully enough of me. So let's meet tonight's participants and introducing in the order in which you appear on the ballot, this is Tina Golan, running as a Republican and who resides in the town of Callis. Correct. And this is Mark Mahali, Democrat, who also resides in the town of Callis. So welcome. Thank you. So Tina, if you would like to start with your two minute opening remark. Thank you, Keith. Hello, my name is Tina Golan. My pronouns are she, her. And I have noticed over the past few elections in Washington County, the lack of a Republican or conservative choice, or in fact, a lack of a woman choice candidate. I am your conservative choice and Vermont voice. I stand for the working class who don't always have a voice because they're too busy working. We are currently experiencing a housing crisis. Housing is not a Republican issue. It is not a Democrat issue. It is an American issue. Society needs to ensure a roof over everyone's head. Housing is a basic need. My platform is basically housing and conservation, common sense solutions, constitutional rights, common ground and core values, and I would like to address veteran friendly programs. I believe that cooperation, compromise, and collaboration are all required to make the policies to benefit all parties. 
I will work across the party lines to adjust policies when necessary. My background is I am a fifth generation New Englander. I grew up in Plainfield and attended Twinfield. Then we moved to Callis to attend U32. I graduated from Keene State College with a BA in environmental journalism. And then I moved back to Callis in 2001 to be next to my family. Thank you. Mark, your opening statement. Well, thank you, Keith, and thanks to Orca for hosting this, and thank you, Tina, for sharing the, this platform for this election to fill the seat now occupied by Janet Ansel, who is retiring at the end of this term, leaving very large shoes to fill. Um, since stepping down, oh, well, I'm Mark Mahali. I live in East Callis with my wife, Chris, who's a children's book author. We have three children and four grandchildren and another on the way. I love rural Vermont because of its amazing, wonderful people and its unique landscape. And uh, I used to uh, be the dean of Vermont Law School, and since stepping down, I've just devoted my time to local issues. I'm the vice chair of the Callis Select Board, and I'm deeply involved in the effort to revitalize the East Callis store and also to uh, strengthen the dam at Curtis Pond so the pond continues to exist. These are areas where groups of local volunteers were able to make really great things happen by leveraging state and federal funds. And it's that effort and its success that has made me really think hard about running for this office. And in that effort, um, I've spent months knocking on doors, listening to the voters of our three towns. And the issues are obvious. Housing is out of reach for normal people. Uh, the cost of uh, propane and oil has gotten to the point where a lot of people are telling me they, they really don't know whether they're going to be able to heat their houses. So these problems require attention and resources from the state government. We can't do them by ourselves. And for that, we need to have effective, consistent, strong, thoughtful representation in Montpelier. So the financial decisions in Montpelier and the laws made there serve our purposes. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. So, Tina, the first question is to you. And this is an easy one. What do you believe is the most important issue facing your district? And if you are elected to the Vermont House, how will you use that role to improve life in your district? Affordable housing is the main issue that I will address at the state level. Basically, we have collected as realtors for the past 20 years a transfer tax. It's called a sales tax uh, that you pay when you buy a house. So we've collected thousands of dollars per transaction, and all of that money was earmarked originally to go towards affordable housing, which was never built. So we need to accommodate for the growing population in central Vermont. And what I will do is make sure that I hold the state legislators and um, policymakers accountable for where the money has gone. Because I have gone to the state and asked, where did this money go? and it's gone to the general fund. So where is the money being spent on affordable housing is the issue that I'm trying to resolve. Thank you, and a 30 second follow up. If you are elected, how will you maintain open communication with the constituents in your district? As a realtor, my phone is on every day, 7 a.m. to 7 p.m., and you can call me anytime with your issues and I will bring them and address them for middle class, low income class. They need to be heard and addressed. Thank you, Tina. So Mark? I think the big issue is rural economic revitalization. I mean, rural Vermont is in trouble, like a lot of rural America. 
things have to change so that people can afford to live here and to heat their homes and to find decent childcare here. Childcare is kind of the base of economic development. So, and, they, and to be able to send their kids to a local school, a local primary school where uh, the kids learn uh, who their neighbors are and, and are safe. So specifically, um, I think we have to leverage state and federal dollars uh, to work on child care, to, to help uh, reduce the price of housing, to work with local districts to build more housing in village centers. We have to build them in village centers. We don't want to grow subdivisions in our beautiful agricultural areas. And to uh, replace find ways to assist people to weatherize their homes and replace the enormous amount of money that we spend on oil in Vermont with renewable resources. And the 30-second follow-up of how would you well, maintain the, open communication? You know, the legislature meets four days a week. And the fifth day a week, will be in. I will be in the district. And I think the best way to do it is with coffees. Uh, well, actually, I'm a tea person, but coffees, so to speak, in each of the three towns. You know, just announce, I'm going to be at such and such a place, come see me. I think that's one way to do it. And to see, to meet with the, the, the select boards. All right, thank you. So the next question, we're going to start with you, Mark. Election security and integrity has been an active discussion both nationally and here in Vermont. Do you believe the legislature should make changes to Vermont's election process? And if so, what changes would you support? I do think we have very good election laws here compared to uh, a lot of other states, but that's a pretty low bar. Um, I do there think there are things we could do. Um, one of the things we can do is make it easier to vote. Right now, we're trying to do that. We register people when they uh, apply for driver's license. They can check a box and register. But I think we can reach out more and find additional ways to sort of make registration almost automatic. We have same-day registration, but I think we have to make it even easier. The other thing I think we have to do is to create a voter pamphlet. Other states, not all of them, but some of them, you get this little phone book in the mail when you get your ballot, and it lists each candidate and a statement by that candidate, and maybe even an opportunity for people who support the candidate to be listed. Um, and if there are issues on the ballot, which we don't have that much, that as well. But I think a, I think a pamphlet, a voter pamphlet, would be a really great thing. I think those two things... Uh, other than, of course, I think we should be teaching civics starting in first grade. Really, really, civics has become important, and we have to push it. All right, thank you. Tina? Question? Election security and integrity has been an active discussion both nationally and here in Vermont. Do you believe the legislature should make changes to Vermont's election process and if so, what changes would you support? I believe that we should have oversight at the election where when you put your ballot in, there should be people overseeing the process. And we should definitely have mail-in voting that is across the board that works really well for people to mail in their ballots. In other states, you can do that so easily, and it's much more easy to vote in other states. But the thing is, again, with the working class, I believe that they don't get a chance to vote sometimes because they're working. And election day happens to be on a weekday, and this is also an issue with town meeting on a weekday. Maybe there should be voting on a Saturday or a Sunday. I'm not sure what would help the turnout, but basically I feel that the younger generation does not vote enough and we need to get out there and help students understand their rights because I've been voting since I was 18 years old every election and that's my right. 
So uh, I believe that we need to instill that in the younger generation and make them get up and vote. Thank you, and thank you for being an active voter here in Vermont. So, Tina, the next question, we are going to start with you. In response to the growing debate surrounding reproductive rights, the Vermont legislature completed the process to create Proposition 5, Amendment 22, that would add reproductive freedom protections into the Vermont Constitution. Do you support this amendment? Yes, I am pro-choice. Obviously, as a woman, I believe it's the woman's choice. But I also believe that it's between the conversation between the woman and her doctor that is of most importance, and that the state doesn't have a right to tell a woman what to do with her body or when. Thank you. Mark? We're completely in agreement on this issue. I support Prop 22. I don't think this is about whether one thinks that abortion is a good thing or not. Because if one doesn't want to, if a woman doesn't want to carry a child to term, she can choose to have the abortion. If she does, thinks that it's wrong to have the abortion, she doesn't have to. The real issue is, should we use the power of the state to tell women what they can do with their bodies? Or in the case of sterilization, it could be men as well. And I think the answer is absolutely not. Now, current law in Vermont pretty much protects that right. But I think that enshrining in the Constitution makes it more permanent, more protected, and most, in a way, really important in right now, tells the other states where we stand. And this is really important. I do think we're going to have some work to do to protect people who travel to Vermont in order to terminate pregnancy and to protect our health care providers from efforts from out of state to reach into Vermont and penalize them. That's going to take some work on the legislature's part. All right, thank you. So the next question, we're going to start with Mark, but I feel as though I'm giving you both an easy opening here because it's housing is becoming <laughs> a critical issue in Vermont. How should Vermont approach the issue of housing, looking both at the need for affordable and accessible housing and the potential conflict of development versus environmental concerns. So starting with you, Mark. OK, so we have both said it's a crisis, and everybody right. knows that. It's pretty complicated. It's not going to be easy to solve this issue. On the low and moderate income side, we are really lucky in Vermont to have the Vermont Housing and Conservation Board, VHCB. And the legislature has appropriated more money in recent years to VHCB to build low and moderate income housing and subsidize it. And I think we've been able to, this is an area where we've been able to leverage federal funding, although we have to be careful because that funding isn't permanent. Um, I think we have to make it easier to build in village centers. And there's a lot of ways we can do that, but we have to work with local government so that there's, this is a collaborative process, and we make it easier to build housing, even multifamily housing, in village centers or, and accessory dwellings on people's property. We also need middle-income housing support because people of middle income can't afford housing either now. So we need for more first-time buyer house assistance than we have, and I think we can have indirect help to the young by tuition support, debt relief, and, and but we just have to be careful how we do it so we don't turn into San Jose, California and have huge sprawl on our beautiful and change our landscape. All right, thank you. Tina. Okay, so to create more housing, there needs to be money, obviously. Phil Scott has done a good job with allocating $250 million this year of ARPA funds and COVID money towards middle income housing and restoring duplexes, multifamily apartment buildings. So we're on the right track. Although when we run out of that money at the end of the year, we do need to figure out where we're going to bring more funds in. And this is my issue again with the transfer tax. We collected as Realtors last year $83 million that was earmarked for affordable housing and 
conservation, which are two separate entities. And then they put on an extra tax for the Lake Champlain Fund. So the money is dwindling away from housing. So that's a big thing. Um, due to Act 250, there are complications in building restrictions that need to be rolled back or modified. And I know the state is working on that for next year, 2023. So that would help. Septic laws are also very stringent in the state, which makes it very hard to build as well. Thank you. I, I noticed that both of you were being very conscious of the timer, and I thank you for that. So Tina, the next question is back to you first again. Gun-related violence is on the increase, both nationally and here in Vermont. Should the Vermont legislature enact additional gun measures? And if so, what measures would you support? I support gun rights for hunters in Vermont and sportsmen. I believe that the Armalite AR-15 in particular was made for Army use only. In that particular gun, if someone under the age of 21 wants to purchase one, maybe they should enter the Army and learn how to use it first. So I stand with the sportsmen and their use and for hunting and fishing and trapping and, and they have a bill of rights themselves, the sportsmen. So I believe that Vermonters are very educated about gun use. They have to take hunting and fishing courses. They have to take, um, have a orange card to use the uh, hunting and um, the gun. They have to take gun course and they are very accountable when it comes to handling guns. I believe that they should be locked up in the house, and that is my stance. Thank you, Tina. Mark? Well, I, I also support hunting. I don't post, we don't post our land, and hunters have been really polite and great with us. Um, I don't think that there's any place for automatic weapons outside of the military in American society and would support efforts to limit them. I, I'm open to further limitations on gun ownership, age of ownership, and longer waiting periods, and just closing loopholes. I'm also concerned this was not a pro about keeping our kids safe in schools. This is not a problem that any one of any of us really want to face. Uh, it's, and it's something we really thought wasn't a problem here in Vermont, but it turns out, as the governor found out, that it is. And we have to be, I think, really thoughtful about protecting our kids in school without turning schools into a fortress. I mean, we don't want to get to a situation where kids really, they feel in, in, unsafe in school because there's so much protection. But I think we have to be really thoughtful about it. All right, thank you, Mark. So, Mark, the next question. Current changes in extreme weather patterns are demonstrating the impact of climate change. Are there actions Vermont should take in response to climate change? And if so, what would you support? You know, I've spent much of my life, I've been an environmental lawyer all my life, spent a lot of my energy on energy issues. Um, I think we have to really reduce our dependence on oil. Vermont spends about a billion, that's B, billion dollars a year on oil and natural gas to heat homes. And that money does not stay in Vermont. Most of it goes to petrostates or Texas. And it's really, it doesn't, it doesn't help us economically, it hurts us. So we need to, to solve that, we need to weatherize our homes. We have 90,000 homes to weatherize in Vermont. And we need to change the heating systems into clean heat, which could be advanced wood, pellet stoves, et cetera, or it could be heat pumps. Well, all of that costs money, and we need to leverage federal money and some of our state money to make that happen. Last year, the legislature passed overwhelmingly the clean heat standard, which would have done that, 
And the governor vetoed it, which I think was a terrible mistake. We almost overrode the veto. But this year, some version of that has to pass. I also think we need to support electric cars. They're too expensive now. We have to subsidize them. But I would aim the subsidy at used electric cars so that people of lesser means can acquire them. Um, so the, and I, the, I think energy is what we have to focus on. All right, thank you. Tina? So as a specialist with climate change in college, I learned about this 25 years ago. I moved back to Vermont to be an environmental journalist and went to Marcellus Parsons and asked for a job. At that time, they didn't care about the environment 20 years ago. But now it comes to be a big issue, and I would start myself with the school systems. I think that the school systems are using a lot of resources that are unnecessary. First, starting with the buses. The buses do not need to be a full-length bus that would accommodate the whole population of that one school. They need to consolidate to smaller vehicles to run the kids around to school and then look into different heating sources and maybe smaller school buildings to accommodate the smaller populations. I also believe that we do need to stop using so much oil for heating fuel. So there are alternatives that I work with on a daily basis when selling homes as a realtor in central Vermont. And those are heat pumps. And we can use propane instead. We can use wood or pellets. And there are many options to reduce the dependence on oil. I want to remind the people who may be watching this live that if you have a question that you would like posed to the candidates, please call Orca Media at 802-224-9901, and the question will be relayed on. So Tina, now that, now that you've had a brief pause, the Vermont legislature has made several attempts to increase the minimum wage. Do you believe the minimum wage should be increased? And if so, to what level? So it needs to be increased generously to accommodate the living standards. In Burlington, I believe you have to make $27 an hour to live in Burlington. So it's has to go up to a minimum of $20 an hour, I would think. And the businesses aren't fond of this, of course. They don't want to pay a higher minimum wage. But I have lived across the country. I have lived in different states. And I know as a previous waitress in college that in some states you only get $2 an hour. So it's a big issue across the country, and it needs to be considered um, minimum wage needs to be more than $15 an hour, closer to $20 an hour. So I, I just want to clarify that based on your answer, you see the minimum wage as needing to be the livable wage. Correct. All right, thank you. So Mark? I, I also support, <clears throat> I support a livable wage. Okay. Um, and we, we do have, actually, compared to other states, a pretty good minimum wage here, but it's not enough. It's not enough to, for a person to live on. Um, you know, one of the things that's happening in Vermont is we're seeing highly skilled workers who know computers and that stuff getting jobs with Google and Apple who's telling them, hey, you don't have to live anywhere. You can live where you want. So they live in Vermont, but their wage scale is the, app, the national Apple or Google wage scale. And, but the people who clean their houses, who service in restaurants, who take care of our kids, they don't have that kind of national wage pressure. And so we're seeing this divide. And I think it's up to us to really do something about that. And the livable wage is a way to do that. We do have to be careful about one thing. We have to be careful about what's called the benefit cliff. That is, we have to make sure that people don't 
we don't set a livable wage such that people lose more state and federal benefits than they gain by the increase in the livable wage. So it has to be done thoughtfully and phased in, I think, so that businesses, particularly small businesses, can adjust. This can be very difficult for them. All right. Thank you. So, Mark, back to you. The Vermont legislature has made several attempts to pass paid family and medical leave. Would you support paid leave? Yes, absolutely. Almost every advanced industrial country provides generous paid family and medical leaves. Um, it's, it's, people talk about being pro-family. One of the best ways you can possibly be pro-family is to have generous medical leave. If we don't do it at the state level, that is if we don't do it by law, it means that uh, businesses don't really have an incentive to do it. In fact, their incentive is to try to avoid spending money unnecessarily. So I think that it helps businesses if we have a level playing field. And the way to have a level playing field is to have that kind of a leave. And by the way, people are worried about that we don't have the population and the jobs. People here, we don't have the working population that we need to do things, and there's certainly truth to that. Well, if we have strong livable wage and we have strong uh, family leave benefit program, it will really attract people to come to this state, and that's important. 30-second follow-up. Part of previous conversations have been should there be a maximum limit on how much leave could be granted or requested? Of course. And, and do you have a sense of what no, you think? No, I don't should? know the okay. amount, but I, of course. We, you want to prevent abuse of any program okay. like this. And people can self-finance after a certain point, but what you really want to do is create a floor. OK, thank you. Tina? And this is pertaining to state jobs. You could, you could direct your answer to state versus private if you would like to. Yes. So I believe that paid leave should be for medical and perhaps pregnancy, and they should have, I would think, a three-month term of paid leave to accommodate for unexpected medical um, hospital. Uh, you could be in the hospital for two or three months, who knows? And after a pregnancy, you need some time to adapt to your new family. So I believe it's really important for people to have paid medical leave. And at the state level, they should incorporate that for sure. And then it would be up to each company to decide if they would provide that. OK, so what I'm hearing you say, just to clarify, is that the state should be required, if it's a private business, that it would be a voluntary buy-in process. Is yes. that accurate? Yes. Okay. Uh, just I would add, my answer was both public and private okay. and mandatory. All right, thank you. So Tina, there have been a series of incidents recently targeting the LGBTQ plus communities, both nationally and here in Vermont, as we've seen by threats surrounding drag queen story hours hosted by local libraries, the vandalizing of rainbow and transgender flags, and the targeting of transgender athletes in public schools. If elected, would you support strengthening Vermont's bullying and bias hate crime statutes? Yes, of course, I would support doing anything I can against racism and hate in Vermont. We do have a problem, and this is a problem across the board, with different states and different populations that are angry, apparently. And we have lots of services and programs to help people understand different communities. We have the BIPOC community. We have transgender community. And they all have to be equalized. And everyone is equal in humanity. So 
we need to have inclusion in Vermont and have an understanding that we support every race and we can't have implicit bias in this state. It's just dehumanizing the population and the anger has to stop. We have to communicate with each other and get along with each other. We're all humans here. There's no reason for this discontent and the um, mental health uh, issue is part of it and we need to help those populations understand that we're all equal here. Thank you. Mark? I'd like to be able to say that discrimination against LGBTQT plus people and immigrants is not a problem in Vermont, and I can't say that. I, when I was dean, I really saw all kinds of problems emerge. We have a substantial population that includes LGBTQT people at the school, and people of, you know, African Americans and Hispanics, and there were just incidents after incident. Uh, you know, an Hispanic woman would be running along the road, and somebody would pull up in the car, roll their window down, and say, go back to Mexico. And people, you, p students just would find this all the time, so it's a real problem. I think we have to start in the schools and educate people to this issue in the schools. I think we have to teach our history truly, whether it's embarrassing or not. And I think uh, there, there's a Truth and Reconciliation Commission that was created by the legislature, we have to support its work. Um, I think that there's a lot that we can do economically as well. We can help renters. We can welcome, there's lots of ways we can welcome immigrants. We could use more immigrants here. I care about this issue deeply. I was a legal aid attorney. I was a Peace Corps volunteer. This, this issue of social justice is very important to me. We can put people of color on the land I was on the board of the Land Trust for 11 years, and we were successful in doing that. So there's a lot we can do. So hold on to that thought, because it leads so well into the next question, which is, as a state, Vermont has begun the process to identify and confront institutional and systemic racism and the impact that it has on our indigenous and communities of color. Is Vermont giving this issue the attention needed? And what actions or initiatives would you support? This is to me, right? This is back yeah, to you. Right. Institutional racism is a serious problem. It's almost kind of hidden because by nature, institutional racism means it's the racism is just built into the normal way that we do things without even intending to be racist or thinking about it. I mean, I can tell you that the way that law schools are regulated creates institutional racism and biases against African Americans, for example. I think that we need to do a lot more. We've started the process, but the most important thing is for the state to be very thoughtful and clear about the institutional, the racism, the impacts of each law and each program on minority populations, disadvantaged groups. This is an area where we've begun that work, but we could do a lot more. So it starts with consciousness, being conscious about what we're doing and what the impact we're, do, uh, what we're doing, and it's um, and analyzing it carefully. All right, thank you. Tina? Question again? As a state, Vermont has begun the process to identify and confront institutional and systemic racism and the impact it has on our indigenous and communities of color. Is Vermont giving this issue the attention needed and what specific actions or initiatives would you support? So this became quite clear during COVID with the BIPOC community and different races that are here in Vermont. I have many friends in the BIPOC community that feel since COVID and since all of the riots in 2020 that their lives may be in jeopardy. 
and there is a lot of bigotry in Vermont. It may be overt racism. It may be covert racism. There's different things going on here. People are brought up in a way that they don't even know that they're racist, but it's their personal attitudes that they have encompassed over their lifetime. And it's per pervasive in this uh, culture that we have this problem. It's a political issue. It's an institutional issue that does has, has to start systemically at the grade, grade level of the young students in Vermont. And we need to teach them, again, that we're all equal human beings and there's no reason to be racist, even if they don't understand that word. Thank you, Tina. So, Tina, the next question is back to you. Vermont has seen an increase in both drug-related deaths and increased emergency room visits due to the opioid crisis. What actions should the legislature take to combat this growing addiction crisis? So the op opioid crisis is uh, very um, difficult for us to all understand. I believe that funding the police is one of the biggest measures that we need to incorporate in going back to funding the police and having more police patrol. And we should not have safe havens for their use. It is illegal. It is destroying the community. It's killing our children. And fentanyl is part of the problem now. And it's a big issue for me and my friends and my family that this is just hitting home for everyone now. So we need to cut through the red tape on this and just get them the mental help that they need, put them in jail, and have them work it out in rehab centers, and don't allow them to go back on the street and reuse, which it hits home for me because I did have a friend that died from fentanyl use this year. And the night before she died, she stated, I'm not dead yet. Thank you for sharing, and I'm sorry for your loss, Tina. So, Mark? Fentanyl addiction, opioid, the whole opi opioid epidemic is one of our most serious problems. I don't think it's a law enforcement problem so much as a treatment problem. These drugs are available, they're available by prescription, and the prescriptions are misused, of course. We have one of the highest rates of addiction in the country, so it's, it's really a serious problem for us. So what to do about it? Well, we have this hub-and-spoke treatment system, mm -hmm. which I think is working pretty well. But I think it needs more funding and more thought. I think we, we have to further expand medication-assisted treatment. Um, and um, I think we have, to have, we have to work more to have safe drug disposal, uh, buprenorphine, buprenorphine distribution, and I must say I really disagree with the governor's veto of safe injection sites. I think this is a problem a lot of Vermonters understand because it cuts across class, race. It doesn't matter who you are. Almost all of us know someone who's in trouble because of addiction and or died of it. It's a really terrible issue. So partly building off both of your answers. Mental health services in the state of Vermont, where should we be putting our attention and what action should the legislature take? And yes, Mark, it's yeah, back it's to me. you. Mental health is really a serious problem here. There, and COVID has made it a lot worse. There are more suicides here than there have ever been. There's more people who need help, and right now, they're going, they're stuck in emergency rooms. 
Sometimes they're stuck in emergency rooms for weeks because of lack of a place. I think this is an area where we really need to pay attention. We really need to increase the funding that flows to mental health. There's just no way around it. The problem is we only have so much money that we have. We can't, I mean, Vermont's a relatively high tax state. It's that way because we have our values here. We believe in education, and it makes the state a great place. We believe in the level of government we have. These values are important to us. But we're going to have to be ingenious in the way that we think of ways to fund mental health. But it, it's, it's the system is on the verge of breaking down. And mental health care providers are leaving the field because it's so stressful. They're so overworked. All right, thank you. Tina, what, how do you think we should respond to mental health services and mental health crisis here in Vermont? Again, we should start with the school systems. We should have counselors available for children and students. As they go through school, they should have counseling available and mental health access for help so that they can get the, the help that they need right from the beginning. And so that they have somebody to listen to them. A lot of the times, uh, parents send their kids to school and they have um, nowhere to go after school. They have no one to talk to. They have limited friends in the rural community, there's no services available for them. So we can start with the school system and help the children understand it's okay to ask for help. Thank you. And building off that, Vermonters are experiencing a dramatic increased cost for health care. What actions should be taken by the legislature to address this issue? Well, yes, I know a big issue. <clears throat> I'm not sure when Obamacare or the Affordable Care Act ends, but it needs to continue. That makes everyone's health care affordable. I know that Medicaid is available for most people under a certain income bracket, which is poverty. That is very helpful for Vermonters to have Medicaid access, and they need to have access points where they can sign up for this program. A lot of the problem with Vermonters is that they don't know where to go to ask for help. They don't know where to get their insurance policy. Um, it's very difficult to go through the process. I know that Capstone and Barry can help people and they can sign you up. There's the, um, the Barry Health and Wellness Clinic. They can sign you up. You just have to go down and do it in person. And you can have Medicaid, I believe it's probably around $16,000 um, income per year, so that's poverty level. But the Obamacare or Affordable Health Care Act provides a subsidy that makes the health care system very affordable for most Vermonters if they know how to use, utilize the program. One minute follow up. And it's because I, as I was listening to your answer, one of the issues is not only the cost, but availability. Do you have a suggestion of, of how we attract providers to Vermont? Blue Cross Blue Shield and MVP are enough providers as far as I'm concerned. No, no, no. An actual health care provider, a doctor or a nurse practitioner oh. that I can go to, not an insurance Correct. provider. Correct. Correct. So it is very difficult to get a primary care doctor right. in Vermont. So you call if you're possibly new to the area, it, you call to get a primary care doctor and they're not taking new patients. There's an overload. So that is a problem that we have to address. We need to support more doctors moving to Vermont. We okay. need to support um, more nurses and we our health care system needs to accommodate the population which across the board that's the big problem is the population is we're overpopulated on a whole it's a worldwide problem all right thank you tina 
So Mark, first part, the cost of health care and how the legislature, and then after that, we will do an additional, how do we attract providers? The health care system is so complicated, I don't fully understand it, and I admit that. Um, I do think we have to pay attention. I'm going to focus on rural Vermont. Healthcare is becoming increasingly centralized, and I'm not sure that works for rural Vermont. One of the great things that we have in our district is a health center in Plainfield, and that's been a real advantage. It's, they can go into the schools, they can offer dental care. I mean, it's really a shame. This is a country where you need, not everybody has access to good dental care. So I think we have to really examine centralization, and that's going to take state action. It can't happen because the market itself alone pushes centralization. I, I think that in rural Vermont, what matters in a lot of ways initially is ambulance service. And we're paying an awful lot of money. Small towns are paying an awful lot of money for ambulance service. And again, I think the, the inequality between urban areas in Vermont, like Chittenden County, where their population is concentrated and it's easier to provide that service versus rural is a real problem. And we have to do something about it. Um, now, I do think we need to train more. I'm on your second part. I was going to say, okay. Although I do think, by the way, I just want to mention the governor has proposed moving state retirees out of Medicare and into Medicare Advantage, and mm -hmm. I don't agree with that. I think okay. that's a wrong step. But um, we have to, the shortage of doctors, p physicians, assistants, and nurses and healthcare workers is a really big problem here. I think we can do something about it. Other states actually pay health workers a, uh, a kind of a, <coughs> they offer them a sum of money, or they offer them housing subsidy, or they actually offer them uh, some sort of subsidy to help them with their medical school or their school debt. And I think we have to look very carefully at what those schools do. I don't think anything's going to happen unless we think we have concerted state action on that. Okay. Both of you made references to education and education, our educational system as being a cornerstone of dealing with racism and addiction, access to mental health. Do you think the current funding formula is working? And if not, how would you change it? <laughs> and aren't you glad that you get to go first, Mark? Yeah, sure. Yeah, it's, thank easy you. For, it's easy because I don't think anyone understands the formula, even the people who work with it, and I don't. I think, actually, the education formula is pretty good in Vermont. It's progressive, and it recognizes the differences between urban and rural school districts, and um, it, it's been tinkered with by the legislature huh. repeatedly in, I think, good ways that... For example, recognize when schools have more disadvantaged students or more students who are foreign and need language assistance. So I think it's not bad. Can it be improved? I'm sure it can, and I don't at this point know how. I do think Act 46, which was the act uh, to consolidate, to promote consolidation. You know, my experience in life is that proponents of consolidating anything they kind of get into their advocacy role and they think it's going to produce results and then they're a little disappointed. Uh, it rarely produces what we think it will produce. But overall, I think the most important part of our education system is the local school, the local primary school, for reasons that go beyond education but have to do with village life. And it's important that we preserve them. Right. Tina. Comments about the education funding formula, and if you would change it, how would you do that? So I've been to many town meetings in Callis since I've lived there so long. And 
there is over expenditures um, on a yearly basis for medical health care for each employee within the school system, which is hundreds of thousands of dollars in some schools. And there are expenditures that could be consolidated, and I believe that schools should be consolidated into possibly larger schools, like U32 serves five towns. Mm -hmm. Why can't we do that with elementary schools? Well, the towns of Worcester and Middlesex don't want to consolidate together, understandably, because one's in the black, one's in the red. They don't want to take on the debt of another town. So it's a big um, problem that encompasses everybody's opinions of, you know, they like their schools the way they are. But we have to move into the future, and these populations in the schools sometimes run 50 or 60 students per school, and they need to be consolidated into larger school populations, I believe. All right, thank you. Can consider more follow-up time on this complicated issue? I will give you both an additional 30 seconds. I really, I think that in terms of educational performance, which was the motivation for Act 46, high school consolidation, larger high schools and larger middle schools are important. Primary schools have a purpose that goes beyond education. It's a way to introduce children to their peers and create a cohesive community. It introduces children into the community. It's a great way for parents in the community to get to know each other. I think it's a really important part of the village fabric which makes Vermont what it is. If we don't have thriving villages, we'll lose the Vermont we love. Tina, an additional 30 seconds for more comment. Well, I don't have children myself, but I do have step-grandchildren that do go to U32 and to Doty School, and I know the importance of the smaller schools for the young children today. But again, I believe that the consolidation of the school districts is imperative to saving money along with revamping and uh, re-insulating and restructuring the whole schools to save money. All right, thank you. So Mark, your one minute closing statement. Well, first of all, thank you, Keith, for doing such a good, in my view, at least, <laughs> such a good job of hosting. And thanks to ORCA for doing this. I've watched these ORCA programs. It's a chance to really see, uh, see your candidates and get to know them in, I think, a pretty good way. Um, overall, one of the, I said earlier it's important to have consistent, thoughtful, sophisticated representation of our three towns. One of the reasons I say that is I don't think the solutions that we need are exactly the same as the solutions in Chittenden County. Chittenden County has a lot of good legislators. Rural Vermont needs really good legislators who can make sure that the laws that are passed work for our three towns. Thank you. Thanks right. for the opportunity. Thank you. Tina. Yes, thanks for having us tonight. This was a great opportunity for you to get to know me. And I have served the Central Vermont community for almost 20 years, bringing Vermonters wealth and well-being through affordable housing. As a realtor, I have become attuned to the needs of Vermonters in the state programs that may need adjustments. I will work day and night to make our, make sure that the issues for low and middle income and Vermonters are heard and addressed at the state level. And my phone line is open every day, 7 a.m. to 7 p.m and check out my website, golanforvermont.com. So thank you to both of you. Thank you. Thank you for your willingness to serve. Thank you for being here. Thank you for your direct answers. Thank you for your integrity. And thank you for your thoughtful responses. And with that, I remind you all, vote.
You should have gotten a mail-in ballot. If you haven't, please contact your town clerk. Thank you and good night.